Section four of Astounding Stories twelve, December nineteen thirty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Part B. What has gone before? A flash of light on Venus, and at Maricopa Flying Field, Lieutenant McGuire and Captain Blake laugh at its possible meaning until the radio's weird call and the sight of a giant ship in the night sky prove their wildest thoughts are facts. Big as an ocean liner it hangs in mid-air, then turns and shoots upward at incredible speed until it disappears entirely in space. McGuire goes to Mount Lawson Observatory, and there he sees the flash on Venus repeated. Professor Sykes, who had observed the first flash, confirms it and sees still more. He sees the enveloping clouds of Venus torn asunder, and beneath them an identifying mark, a continent shaped like the letter L. And then the great ship comes again. It hovers above the observatory and settles slowly down. Back at Maricopa Field, Captain Blake has tested a new plane for altitude, and is now prepared to interview the stranger in the higher levels. McGuire's frantic phone call sends him out into the night with the 91st Squadron of Planes in support. It is their last flight, for all but Blake. The invader smothers them in a great sphere of gas, but Blake, with his oxygen flasks, flies through to crash beside the observatory. Only Blake survives to see the enemy land, while strange man-shapes loot the buildings and carry off McGuire and Sykes. A bombardment with giant shells dispels the last doubt of the earth being under attack. The flashes from Venus at regular intervals spout death and destruction upon the earth. A mammoth gun, sunk into the planet itself, bears once upon the earth at every revolution, until the changing position of the globes takes the target out of range. In less than a year and a half the planets must meet again. It is war to the death, a united world against an enemy unknown an enemy who has conquered space, and there is less than a year and a half in which to prepare. Far out in the blackness of space, McGuire and Sykes are captives in the giant ship. Their stupor leaves them. They find themselves immersed in clouds. The clouds part. Their ship drops through, and below them is a strange continent shaped like the letter L, captives of inhuman but man-shaped things. They are landing upon a strange globe upon the planet Venus itself. CHAPTER Eight. Miles underneath the great ship from which Lieutenant McGuire and Professor Sykes were now watching through a floor window of thick glass was a glittering expanse of water, a great ocean. The flickering gold expanse that reflected back the color of the sunlit clouds passed to one side as the ship took its station above the island, a continent in size that had shown by its shape like a sharply formed L, an identifying mark to the astronomer. They were high in the air. The thick clouds that surrounded this new world were miles from its surface, and the things of the world that awaited were tiny and blurred. Airships passed and repassed far below, large, some of them, as bulky as the transport they were on. Others were small flashing cylinders, but all went swiftly on their way. It must have come some ethereal vibration to warn others from the path, for layer after layer of craft were cleared for the descent. A brilliant light flashed into view, a dazzling pinpoint on the shore below, and the great ship fell suddenly beneath them. Swiftly it dropped down the pathway of light. On even keel it fell down and still down, till McGuire, despite his experience in the air, was sick and giddy. The light blinked out at their approach. It was some minutes before the watching eyes recovered from the brilliance to see what mysteries might await, and then the surface was close and the range of vision small. A vast open space, a great court paved with blocks of black and white, a landing field perhaps, for about it in regular spacing other huge cylinders were moored. Directly beneath in a clear space was a giant cradle of curved arms. It was a mammoth structure and the men knew at a glance that this was the bed where their great ship would lie. The smooth pavement seemed slowly rising to meet them as their ship settled close. Now the cradle was below, its arms curved and waiting. The ship entered their grasp, and the arms widened, then closed to draw the monster to its rest. Their motion ceased. 
they were finally, beyond the last faint doubt, at anchor on a distant world. A shrill cackle of sound recalled them from the thrill of this adventure, and the attenuated and lanky figure, with its ashen blotchy face that glared at them from the doorway, reminded them that this excursion into space was none of their desire. They were prisoners, captives from a foreign land. A long hand moved its sinuous fingers to motion them to follow, and McGuire regarded his companion with a hopeless look and a despondent shrug of his shoulders. "'No use putting up a fight,' he said. "'I guess we'd better be good.' He followed where the figure was stepping through a doorway into a corridor beyond. They moved, silent and depressed, along the dimly lighted way. The touch of cold metal walls was as chilling to their spirits as to their flesh. But the mood could not last. The first ray of light from the outside world sent shivers of anticipation along their spines. They were landing, in very fact, upon a new world. Their feet were to walk where never man had stood. Their eyes would see what mortal eyes had never visioned. Fears were forgotten, and the men clung to each other not for the human touch but because of an ecstasy of intoxicating, soul-filling joy in the sheer thrill of adventure. They were gripping each other's hand, round-eyed as a couple of children, as they stepped forward into the light. Before them was a scene whose blazing beauty of color struck them to frozen silence. Their exclamations of wonder died unspoken on their lips. They were in a city of the stars and to their eyes it seemed as if all the brilliance of the heavens had been gathered for its building. The spacious open court itself stood high in the air among the masses of masonry, and beyond were countless structures. Some towered skyward, others were lower, and all were topped with bulbous towers and graceful minarets that made a forest of gleaming opal light, opalescence everywhere. It flashed in red and gold and delicate blues, from every wall and cornice and roof. Quartz? marveled Sykes after one long drawn breath. Quartz or glass? What are they made of? It is fairyland. A jeweled city, garish it might have been, and tawdry in the full light of the sun. But on these weirdly unreal structures the sun's rays never shone. They were illumined only by the soft golden glow that diffused across this world from the cloud masses far above. McGuire looked up at that uniform, glowing, golden mass that paled toward the horizon and faded to the gray of banked clouds. His eyes came slowly back to the ramp that led downward to the checkered black and white of the court. Beyond, an open portion of the pavement was solidly massed with people. People. We might as well call them that, McGuire had told Sykes. They are people of a sort, I suppose. We'll have to give them credit for brains. They've beaten us a hundred years in their inventions. He was trying to see everything, understand everything, at once. There was not time to single out the new impressions that were crowding upon him. The air, it was warm to the point of discomfort. It explained the loose, light garments of the people. It came to the two men laden with strange scents and stranger sounds. McGuire's eyes held with hungry curiosity upon the dwellers in this other world. He stared at the gaping throng from which came a bedlam of shrill cries. Lean, colorless hands gesticulated wildly and pointed with long fingers at the two men. The din ceased abruptly at a sharp, whistled order from their captor. He stood aside with a guard that had followed from the ship, and he motioned the two before him down the gangway. It was the same scarlet one who had faced them before, the one whom McGuire had attacked in a frenzy of furious fighting only to go down to blackness and defeat before the slim cylinder of steel and its hissing gas. And the slanting eyes stared wickedly in cold triumph as he ordered them to go before him in his march of victory. McGuire passed down toward the masses of color that were the ones who waited. There were many in the dull red of the ship's crew, others in sky blue, in gold and pink, and combinations of brilliance that blended their loose garments to kaleidoscopic hues. But the figures were similar in one unvarying aspect. They were repulsive and ghastly, and their faces showed bright blotches of blood vessels and blue markings of veins through their parchment-gray skins. The crowd parted to a narrow living lane, and lean fingers clutched writhingly to touch them as they passed between the solid ranks. 
McGuire had only a vague impression of a great building beyond, of lower stories decorated in barbaric colors, of towers above and strange forms of the crystal, colorful beauty they had seen. He walked toward it unseeing. His thoughts were only of the creatures round about. "'What damned beasts!' he said. Then, like his companion, he set his teeth to restrain all show of feeling, as they made their way through the lane of incredible living things. They followed their captor through a doorway into an empty room, empty save for one blue-clad individual who stood beside an instrument board let into the wall. Beyond was a long wall, where circular openings yawned huge and black. The one at the instrument panel received a curt order. The weird voice of the man in red repeated a word that stood out above his curious wordless tone. Torg, he said. And again McGuire heard him repeat the syllable. The operator touched here and there among his instruments, and tiny lights flashed. He threw a switch, and from one of the black openings, like a deep cave, came a rushing roar of sound. It dropped to silence as the end of a cylindrical car protruded into the room. A door in the metal car opened, and their guard hustled them roughly inside. The one in red followed, while behind him the door clanged shut. Inside the car was light, a diffused radiance from no apparent source. The whole air was glowing about them, and beneath their feet the car moved slowly but with a constant acceleration that built up to tremendous speed. Then that slackened, and Sykes and McGuire clung to each other for support, while the car that had been shot like a projectile came to rest. Phew! breathed the lieutenant. That was quick delivery. Sykes made no reply, and McGuire too fell silent to study the tremendous room into which they were led. Here, seemingly, was the stage for their next experience. A vast open hall with a floor of glass that was like obsidian, empty but for carved benches about the walls. There was room here for a mighty concourse of people. The walls, like those they had seen, were decorated crudely in glaring colors, and embellished with grotesque designs that proclaimed loudly the inexpert touch of the draftsman. Yet above them the ceiling sprang lightly into vaulted sweeping curves. McGuire's training had held little of architecture, yet even he felt the beauty of line and airy gracefulness of treatment in the structure itself. The contrast between the flaunting colors and the finished artistry that lay beneath must have struck a discordant note to the scientist. He leaned closer to whisper. "'It is all wrong some way. The whole world. Beauty and refinement, then crude vulgarity, as incongruous as the people themselves. They do not belong here. Neither do we, was McGuire's reply. It looks like a tough spot that we're in. He was watching toward a high, arched entrance across the room. A platform before it was raised some six feet above the floor, and on this were seats, ornate chairs, done in sweeping scrolls of scarlet and gold. A massive seat in the center was like the fantastic throne of a child's fairy tale. From the corridor beyond that entrance, came a stir and rustling that riveted the man's attention. A trumpet peal, vibrant and peculiar, blared forth from the ceiling overhead, and the red figures of the guards stood at rigid attention, with lean arms held stiffly before them. The one in scarlet took the same attitude, then dropped his hands to motion the two men to give the same salute. "'You go to hell,' said Lieutenant McGuire in his gentlest tones and the scarlet figure's thin lips were snarling as he turned to whip his arms up to their position. The first of a procession of figures was entering through the arch. Sykes, the scientist, was paying little attention. "'It isn't true,' he was muttering aloud. "'It can't be true. Venus, twenty-six million miles at inferior conjunction.' He seemed lost in silent communion with his own thoughts. Then— but I said there was every probability of life. I pointed out the similarities. Hush, warned McGuire. The eyes of the scarlet man were sending wicked looks in their direction. Tall forms were advancing through the arch. They, too, were robed in scarlet, and behind them others followed. The trumpet peal from the dome above held now on a long-drawn single note, while the scarlet men strode in silence across the dais and parted to form two lines an inverted V that faced the entrance, 
They were an assembly of rigid, blazing statues, whose arms were extended like those on the floor below. The vibrant tone from on high changed to a crashing blare that shrieked discordantly to send quivering protest through every nerve of the waiting men. Those about them were shouting, and again the name of Torg was heard, as in the high arch another character appeared to play his part in a strange drama. Thin like his companions, yet even taller than them, he wore the same brilliant robes, and, an additional mark of distinction, a headdress of polished gold. He acknowledged the salute with a quick raising of his own arms, then came swiftly forward and took his place upon the massive throne. Not till he was seated did the others on the platform relax their rigid pose and seat themselves in the semicircle of chairs, and not till then did they so much as glance at the men waiting there before them, the two earthmen, standing in silent, impassive contemplation of the brilliant scene and with their arms held quiet at their sides. Then every eye turned full upon the captives, and if McGuire had seen deadly malevolence in the face of their captor, he found it a hundredfold in the inhuman faces that looked down upon them now. The inquiring mind of Professor Sykes did not fail to note the character of their reception. "'But why?' he asked in whispers of his fellow prisoner. "'Why this open hatred of us? What possible animus can they have against the earth or its people?' The figure on the throne voiced a curt order. The one who had brought them stepped forward. His voice was raised in the same discordant, singing tone that leaped and wandered from note to note. It conveyed ideas, that was apparent. It was a language that he spoke, and the central figure above nodded a brief assent as he finished. Their captor took an arm of each in his long fingers, and pushed them roughly forward to stand alone before the battery of hard eyes. Now the crowned figure addressed them directly. His voice quavered sharply in what seemed an interrogation. The men looked blankly at each other. Again the voice questioned them impatiently. Sykes and McGuire were silent. Then the young flyer took an involuntary step forward and looked squarely at the owner of the harsh voice. "'We don't know what you are saying,' he began, "'and I suppose that our lingo makes no sense to you.' He paused in helpless wonderment as to what he could say. Then— "'But what the devil is it all about?' he demanded explosively. "'Why all the dirty looks? You've got us here as prisoners. Now what do you expect us to do? Whatever it is, you'll have to quit singing it and talk something we can understand.' He knew his words were useless, but this reception was getting on his nerves, and his arm still tingled where the scarlet one had gripped him. It seemed, though, that his meaning was not entirely lost. His words meant nothing to them but his tone must have carried its own message. There were sharp exclamations from the seated circle. The one who had brought them sprang forward with outstretched, clutching hands. His face was a blood-red blotch. McGuire was waiting in crouching tenseness that made the red one pause. "'You touch me again,' said the waiting man, "'and I'll knock you into an outside loop.' The attacker's indecision was ended by a loud order from above. McGuire turned as if he had been spoken to by the leader on the throne. His eyes were boring into those of the lieutenant, and he held the motionless pose for many minutes. To the angry man, staring back and upward, there came a peculiar optical illusion. The evil face was vanishing in a shifting cloud that dissolved and reformed as he watched into pictures. He knew it was not there, the thing he saw. He knew he was regarding something as intangible as thought, but he got the significance of every detail. They were being crushed like ants beneath a tremendous heel. He knew that the foot that could grind out their lives was that of the one on the throne. The cloud stuff melted to new forms that grew clearer to show him the earth, a distorted earth, and he knew the distortion came from the mind of the being before him who had never seen the earth at first hand. Yet he knew it for his own world. It was turning in space. He saw oceans and continents, and before his mental gaze he saw the land swarming with these creatures of Venus. The one before him was in command. He was seated on an enormous throne. There were earth people like Sykes and himself who crept humbly before him, while fleets of great Venusian ships hovered overhead. The message was plain, plain as if written in words of fire in the brain of the man. McGuire knew that these creatures intended that the vision should be true. They meant to conquer the earth. 
The slim, khaki-clad figure of Lieutenant McGuire quivered with the strength of his refusal to accept the truth of what he saw. He shook his head to clear it of these thought-wraiths. "'Not in a million years,' he said, and he put behind his words all the mental force at his command. "'Try that, old top, and they'll give you the fight of your life.' He checked his words as he saw plainly that the thin, cruel face that stared and stared was getting nothing from his reply. "'Now what do you think about that?' he demanded of Professor Sykes. "'He got an idea across to me, some form of telepathy. I saw his mind, or I saw what he wanted me to see of it. It's taps,' he says, for us, and then they think they're going across and annex the world.' He glanced upward again, and laughed loudly for the benefit of those who were watching him so closely. "'Fine chance,' he said. "'A fat chance.' but in the deeper recesses of his mind he was shaken. For themselves there was no hope. Well, that was all in a lifetime. But the other, the conquest of the earth, he had to try with all his power of will to keep from his mind the pictures of destruction these beastly things could bring about. The chief of this strange council made a gesture of contempt with the grotesque hands that were so translucent yet ashy pale against his scarlet robe and the down-drawn thin lips reflected the thoughts that prompted it. The open opposition of Lieutenant McGuire failed to impress him, it seemed. At a word the one who had brought them sprang forward. He addressed himself to the circle of men, and he harangued them mightily in harsh discordance. He pointed one lean hand at the two captives, then beat it upon his own chest. "'They are mine,' he was saying, as the men knew plainly and they realized, as if the weird talk came like words to their ears, that this monster was demanding that the captives be given him. An exchange of dismayed glances, and not so good, said McGuire under his breath. Simon Legree is asking for his slaves. Mean, ugly devil, that boy. The lean figures on the platform were bending forward, an expression of mirth, distorted animal smiles, upon their flabby lips. They represented to the humans, so helpless before them, a race of thinking things in whom no last vestige of kindness or decency remained. But was there an exception? One of the circle was standing. The one beside them was sullenly silent, as the other on the platform addressed their ruler. He spoke at some length, not with the fire and vehemence of the one who had claimed them, but more quietly and dispassionately and his cold eyes, when they rested on those of McGuire and Sykes, seemed more crafty than actively ablaze with malevolent ill-will. Plainly it was the counsellor now, addressing his superior. His inhuman voice was silenced by a reply from the one on the throne. He motioned, this gold-crowned figure of personified evil, toward the two men, and his hand swept on toward the one who had spoken. He intoned a command in harsh gutturals that ended in a sibilant shriek and the two standing silent and hopeless exchanged looks of despair. They were being delivered to this other, that much was plain, but that it boded anything but captivity and torment they could not believe. That last phrase was too eloquent of hissing hate. The creature rose, tall and ungainly, from his throne. Amid the salutations of his followers he turned and vanished through the arch. The others of his council followed, all but one. He motioned to the two men to come with him, and the sullen one who had demanded the men for himself obeyed an order from this counsellor who was his superior. He snapped an order, and four of his men ranged themselves about the captives as a guard. Thin metal cords were whipped about the wrists of each. Their hands were tied. The wire cut like a knife-edge if they strained against it. The new director of their destinies was vanishing through an exit at one side of the great hall. Their guard hustled them after. A corridor opened before them to end in a gold-lit portal. It was daylight out beyond, where a street was filled with hurrying figures in many colors. With quavering shrieks they scattered like frightened fowls, as an airship descended between the tall buildings that reflected its passing in opalescent hues. It was a small craft compared with the one that had brought them, and it swept down to settle lightly upon the street with no least regard for those who might be crushed by its descent. Consideration for their fellows did not appear as a marked characteristic of this strange people, McGuire observed thoughtfully. 
They swarmed in endless droves, these multicolored beings who made of the thoroughfare an ever-changing kaleidoscope. And what was a life or two, more or less, among so many? He found no comfort for themselves in the thought. Shoulder to shoulder the two followed where the scarlet figure of the counselor moved toward the waiting ship. Only the professor paid further heed to their surroundings. He marveled aloud at the numbers of the people. Hundreds of them, he said. Thousands. They are swarming everywhere like rats. Horrible. His eyes passed on to the buildings in their glory of delicate hues, as he added, and the contrast they make with their surroundings. It is all wrong some way. I wish I knew. They were in the ship when McGuire replied. I hope we live long enough to satisfy your curiosity, he said grimly. The ship was rising beneath them. The opal and quartz of the city's walls were flashing swiftly down. End of chapter 8